big trade today. Winnipeg Jets acquiring Sean Monahan. We have over 1,100 people live in the chat right now. Jet fans want to hear from Murat Atesh, and he joins us now. Murat, great to have you on the program today, and uh, perfect time. We've got a lot to talk about. Yeah, great to be here. No shortage of news, and you know, I'm actually spending the break in L.A. where a coach was just fired, and of course, Winnipeg acquired Sean Monahan. So, yeah, happy to get to all of it. Yeah, I mean, we'll uh, maybe get to the LA situation in the world, but I mean, let's start with Monahan. I mean, what was your what were your first reaction when uh, you heard the Jets acquired Monahan as well as the price that Kevin Sheveldayoff paid to uh, shore up their center position? So I have outgoing texts in my phone going back two weeks and a couple of days uh, to multiple people, agents, friends, but people around the NHL, basically asking, "Can you think of a better fit?" for the Winnipeg Jets than Sean Monaghan. Can you think of a Sean Monaghan type fit that checks all of those same boxes for the Jets that isn't Sean Monaghan? Is there, is there a better version of that available? Is there a different version of that available? And so when Winnipeg actually pulled the trigger and closed the deal on him, I thought to myself, well, hey, they were so shopping for a Sean Monaghan type. Of course it's him. Um, I do. I can, I can say with confidence he's a player that the Jets have liked for a long time. That is one of those situations where he's been on the radar for a minute. I know he got hurt heading into the trade deadline last year. That may have had an effect. Uh, the other thing, though, in addition to the idea that they this is a player that they wanted for some time, is this is not Paul Stastny. This is not a star-level player. This is maybe not even Winnipeg's second-line center that they acquired. You consider how Winnipeg runs things. Sean Monahan is going to be a secondary scoring line center with Cole Perfetti and Nikolai Ehlers. With Adam Lowry doing so much heavy lifting for Rick Bonus, you can uh, you can think of it as almost a middle six acquisition, a third line center on a lot of nights. And if you do keep your expectations in check in that regard, I think he's a great fit for Winnipeg. You know, the I, I mean, I'm sort of with you. I mean, he certainly does tick off a couple of the boxes, and we know Rick Bonus is going to love his prowess in the faceoff circle. Um, and he's been scoring, and I get the hope certainly would be, Murat, is that Sean Monaghan can uh, help improve the fortunes of the Winnipeg Jets' power play, which has been a big topic this year. Despite the 30 wins the team has put up, the special team's performance just has not been there so far. Um, how are you feeling about Monaghan's ability to add some uh, add some life to a power play that uh, has struggled? Yeah, so that was actually one of my first plays after getting up a couple of words for The Athletic, and I have a bunch more coming today. Got a full deep dive going into it. And, of course, Kevin Sheveldayoff is speaking soon, too. Um, but my first play after that was to watch 40 Sean Monaghan power play shifts back to back to back to back. Uh, and so what he's done in Montreal is he's uh, scored 10 power play assists so far this season. He's on pace to set a new career high on that front. How is he doing it? He's playing in the bumper position, middle of the ice. He's got tremendous vision. He's got eyes on the back of his head, really. And he gets a lot of puck touches from that position. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if the if the player who plays that position is going to necessarily be able to single-handedly reroute the Winnipeg Jets' fortunes. I think that Winnipeg's power play struggles more to an overall lack of movement than it does uh, a sense of the personnel not being good enough. Like, are you kidding me? Mark Scheifele is not good enough to quarterback an elite power play. Yes, he is. But I think that the way that they've run things has been a challenge. So I'm not saying he comes in and immediately fixes that. I am saying that he does some things that Winnipeg needs. And based off what, what, what I watched from his Montreal ships, here's what he's going to do. He's going to play the bumper position in the middle of the ice, likely on Winnipeg's top power play. He's going to move his feet slightly. He's going to be in motion um Within that role, he's going to open up lanes that way, and he's going to have his head on a swivel. He's going to make smart passes, quick decisions, and move that puck into dangerous positions from that spot. Is that a single-handed power play turnaround? No, but I think it's going to be good performance at a spot that Winnipeg has a job opening. Um, how important is the face-off circle in this deal? I mean, it depends on what lens you want to wear. Rick Bonus, NHL coaches... The, the memory of so many big plays decided off of face-off wins, believe me, that matters. And Winnipeg has talked about face-offs a lot. Rick Bonus values face-offs a lot. You go back to Sean Monaghan's, you know, sort of post-injury career. If you focus just on Montreal, he's won 55% of his draws 
at even like overall 55 percent of his draws on the power play that's going to give rick bonus and company trust and faith and optimism that he can win those defensive zone draws on the left side his strong side he can be somebody who wins draws when adam lowry isn't going or when he needs a break because certainly that's been winnipeg's premier face-off guy this season uh, so that is going to be big and i think that the confidence that winnipeg will have from his role as a face-off winner is going to have a trickle down because Shifley's line is a known quantity when healthy. Lowry's line is a known quantity. But one thing that happens is that secondary scoring line with Ehlers and Perfetti gets off the bench third, and that's not just third off the beginning of a game. It's third off of a TV timeout. It's third when things get chaotic. I think Sean Monaghan's ability to win those D-zone draws, offer a little bit of size, get that puck going north. He's not a premier shutdown defender, but he can win those draws and do some things, move the puck. I think that's going to offer more ice time, more confidence in that line overall. And if Winnipeg's a playoff performer, you need three lines that can outproduce their minutes. And I think that's going to be an enormous piece. By the way, shout out to, uh, and listen, everybody in chat. We're uh, setting records today with the amount of people joining us live on YouTube. Great to have everybody new here. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. We're here Monday to Friday, 1 p.m. here on Winnipeg Sports Talk, live on YouTube. And follow the uh, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your favorite pods. Comes out right after the show, usually around three thirty in time for your uh, for your ride home. And hey, thanks very much to Scan- Stan Scott who loved our visit with Dennis Bayak. Nice, uh, appreciate the super chat, Stan. Dennis is a class act. Great show, guys. Um, you know, Marat, it, Rick Bonus has said it looks like Sean Monahan is going to start with Nikolai Ehlers and Cole Perfetti. Um, that was the real big hole the minute Vlad Nemetsnikov moved into Mark Shifley's spot. Um, you sort of mentioned this in your last answer, so I'll probe a little bit more. Um, for folks that have been hoping to see more Perfetti and more Ehlers out at 5-on-5, five five, um, should this maybe get those numbers up a little bit, the addition to Sean Monaghan? I mean, it should get those numbers up. Absolutely. Does it get them up high enough to warrant that listing as the second line that you got on the projected lines list there? I honestly don't know. Like that Nino, Lowry, and Appleton line, I love that you've had to shorten Niederreiter because it's so long for the graphic. Like that is Winnipeg's matchup ready line. It's one Rick Bonus is going to go to a lot. And you better believe it's doing heavy lifting in the playoffs in any sort of home ice advantage matchup situation. Um, but the thing to consider when you're asking, like, are they going to get more minutes, Perfetti and Ehlers with Monaghan between them? Consider that Perfetti is playing less this season than last. Like, given his increase in experience, giving, given his increase in offensive ability, the way that the game has slowed down for him, the reason is that Pierre-Luc Dubois is gone and you don't, you don't have a big centerman down the middle that the coaching staff trusts to sort of insulate the young guy. Monaghan is that. He'll win more of his draws as well. Uh, and certainly give you a more consistent effort each night, even though his top end isn't as high as Dubois is going to be. And I think that that alone is going to have a boost to those guys' minutes. I also think Nemestikov's role isn't done. There's going to be a shift somewhere down the line where Nemestikov steps in, plays that left wing role beside Monaghan and Ehlers when the coaching staff isn't ready to trust the young guy. You know, um, <laughs> there's, there's so many angles to this deal and what it does to the Jets going forward. It's also interesting about the timing of it. Um, let's back up to earlier this week. Thoughts on the price that Vancouver paid to get Elias Lindholm and how much that might have tied into Shovel Day Off realizing that this is the cost we're going to have to pay to get a guy like Monaghan. He's the guy we want and doing it now. Yeah, I mean, head to theathletic.com and read Julian McKenzie and Thomas Drance's amazing behind-the-trade story on Elias Lindholm. I mean, the timeline of that, the acceleration from Sunday throughout the week, the the texts and phone calls from airplanes and vacation spots and all of that, and then compare it to what Winnipeg was up to this week. Compare it to the Declan Chisholm waving, and then no player gets called up. Compare it to the fact that Montreal was optimistic about a first-round pick, but no team was really ready to, to pay that price until Lindholm was off the market. So that trade for me does a lot of things. One, it takes the the grade A, like the star caliber center off the market, and it makes everybody pivot to Montreal, Winnipeg included, as far as I see it. And so whether Winnipeg ever felt it was in on Lindholm or close to Lindholm or what have you, I can't say. 
But I can say with confidence that that shifted the approach to Monaghan, who, like I say, is a player that Winnipeg has liked for a long time. What it let Montreal do was say, you know what, our own second round pick that you got in that Pierre-Luc Dubois trade, no, that's that's not good enough. No, it's sure it's just a, a 10 pick difference. You're going to have a late first round pick that you're giving us for this versus an early second round pick that Montreal second is going to be. But once everybody pivots to Monaghan on a relatively thin center market, it increases the price that Montreal can ask for rightfully. And it increases the urgency for Winnipeg to make sure that it gets out in front of it. Because at the end of this house, this is what it is for me. In the seasons where Winnipeg has been a legit contender, for me, that's 2018 and 2019 only. The rest is window dressing. Those two years were legitimate contention years. Winnipeg went out and swung. Paul Stastny, Kevin Hayes, those were the centerpieces of those two years. This early acquisition, being willing to pay a first-round pick for it, have a little cap space left over. What the indication is, is that the Jets believe in themselves this year and they're willing to go for it. Well, I think that there is really some value in doing it now as opposed to waiting to the deadline. In that we know how patient Kevin Chevaldeoff can be. I mean, he's done it over and over again, waiting and waiting and waiting and then making his move. But with the landscape of this division and the West, to be honest, and I can say the same thing about Vancouver, you know, with the opportunity to potentially finish first in the division, getting the help now as opposed to waiting for a month. I think has some real value as well because the bottom line is we can get into LA in a minute with where that team is, as well as the other teams that are vying for wild cards. I mean, in my opinion, there's a significant gap between Edmonton, Vancouver, Vegas, Winnipeg, Colorado, Dallas, to those teams that are going to be in the wild card spot. So by winning the division, not only do you get home ice and an opponent that should be a better matchup, Teams like Colorado and Dallas will beat the hell out of each other for that first round of the playoffs, and then you've got home ice. Like, I think this is also the aggressiveness of the timing has to do with what's at stake for the final 35-odd games once play gets going in uh, in uh, on Tuesday. Yeah, that, and you can, you can also sell me on the idea that the longer run it at forming that fit that Monaghan has with the club, the better Winnipeg's odds of having success and him um, finding chemistry with Ehlers and Perfetti and whoever he ends up playing with there and on the power play. I think there's something to be said about that. And your point about the standings is also true. You know, people might have bristled when I called 2019 a contention year. It was a first round exit year. Well, part of that was crumbling down the stretch and having to play against the St. Louis Blues in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs on their way to the cup. Um, you don't want to risk that kind of uh, that kind of misstep, I think, in a season like this. And cementing Winnipeg's roster, giving themselves an option this early um, is, is a big thing for me. But I also think that the market has so much to do with it. If I go to the, you know, the comment section at The Athletic or on Twitter, who do I get asked about? It's players like Boone Jenner, who Columbus is not in a hurry to move their captain. One of the few things that has gone right for them this year. Casey Middlestadt who Buffalo has spent years watching the development path of, they're not in a hurry to get rid of him. One of the bright spots in a season like this. Adam Henrique, 10-team no trade clause, a little bit of a soft spot for the New York area after New Jersey life for so long for him. Like, you go down the list, um, and I think it's vital that Winnipeg gets a player that it feels like can be a fit for them, lest the other players end up either not on the market at all or go to go to other places. This is one of those situations where getting in front of it, I think, was necessary if they were going to make the move at all. Well, and, and another thing when you're comparing him to a couple of those other players, and let's just take out Adam Henrique because he's a guy that we've kicked around quite a bit. There's a big difference in how much they make. Um, Henrique, I believe, is 5'6 or 5'7, like over $5.5 million a year. Monaghan comes in. Montreal's not taking any of the salary, but he's at 1.9. Give us the impact the cap impact of acquiring Monaghan and, you know, considering they've already traded their first round pick, but there still are other assets. If they wanted to continue to make moves, what is Kevin Chevalier still able to do based on the current roster now that Monaghan is in Winnipeg? Well, as of right this minute, the Jets are projected to have roughly $3.3 million of deadline day cap space. So, 
being able to add roughly $3.3 million worth of contracts. And that in and of itself, you know, at first glance is tremendous. It gives the option of, um, of quality players. If there are proper expensive players, like, a, like I, I can't remember Chris Tanev's contract off the hop or what have you. If there are players- four or five. So if there's contract retention in a trade like that, Winnipeg can afford it. You know, that's that's kind of the major the major difference of acquiring a Monaghan versus um, versus an Adam Henrique is that there's room to play. Now that 3.3 million number is going to go down a little bit because Cole Perfetti is likely to hit the, about $850,000 worth of performance bonuses on his entry level contract. So subtract that. There's also going to be some finagling as guys get healthy, as other players possibly get hurt. There could be some finagling as another player is set is sent down. So 3.3 isn't an exact number to go running with, but the big difference is it leaves room to play. And if there is a fit, if there is a deal to be had, something that Shevel Dayoff can find that he believes will help this team, they have the calf space to do it. And of course, the, the budgetary support from ownership. The last thing kind of hus on the cap space thing, we don't talk enough, nobody talks enough about how important it was for the Jets to trade Brian Little's contract a couple seasons back. The fact that Winnipeg is not in long-term injured reserve this season, as they would have been with Little in tow, as they would have had to go into with the various injuries they've had if Little's contract was still around or if they hadn't managed the cap as well as they have, wouldn't have allowed any of this to happen. Not Monaghan, and certainly not the thought of even one more move before this is all said and done. No, it is a great point, and that uh, you know, I mean, the uh, <laughs> some, I mean, it is confusing, and sometimes it's complicated, and because of that, that's not something you know, we spend a lot of time talking about daily. But the NHL GMs do, and every single deal right now. Um, it is so intertwined with what you were able to add and have on your roster. And, you know, the Calgary-Vancouver trade, it was interesting in one way in that, you know, you got Lindholm who was getting a pretty good deal. You're getting a player that scored 39 goals last year, but who also makes $5.5 million. I mean, the ability to get that money off the cap to allow Lindholm was also a big part of the deal. And I think added into, at least on the surface, the very large package that Vancouver had to pony up to get Lindholm there. Yeah, and it's, an, it's a case of, I think Patrick Alvin's done this a couple of times, striking a little bit early, and that may have required a premium. Certainly Kuzmenko's situation is a little bit unique, and there's other kind of things there. But they did they did offer quality, and there is a lot there to, to earn the services of a player like Lindholm. I've got to be honest, like when I wrote about the trade targets for the Winnipeg Jets, Lindholm was number one with the extreme caveat, and you can find it there saying, I think there's going to be a bidding war for this player. Next up, Sean Monaghan. I think this is the realistic acquisition. Um, I didn't know that it was going to be Vancouver. I really had no no hunch. And it's it's interesting to me how confident that team is in trying to consolidate the start that it's had. You know, Canada's cooking this year, and it's it's fun to watch. Like, I, I really genuinely enjoy this. Well, and I mean, we've talked a little bit about the potential for some pretty juicy all-Canadian matchups in the playoffs. I mean, Edmonton and Vancouver in the Pacific Division, and, you know, if the Jets can somehow find their way out of the Central Division, there absolutely is the potential of an all-Canadian conference final, which would guarantee a Canadian team in the NHL. And the happiest people would be in those tall buildings in Toronto that work for Roger Sportsnet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, numbers, big numbers, big numbers. I just, I want, I, I've said this before, right? Like we all pretend that we're, I don't know if we all pretend, but like there's this idea that we're all perfectly objective robots. And certainly I try to do the analysis that way. But I do not shy away from the fact that I want the people who read my stuff to be happy. Like I wouldn't, I, I couldn't be happier if everybody in this chat, these 1,100 people, these Jets fans tuning in who are excited to see what happens this season. If you get exactly what you want, I will be thrilled. Like that's joy. Well, that uh, there, there seems to be a lot of it so far. Like I, I will. I, oh, by the way, 1,200 now. Welcome to everybody new. Hit that subscribe button. I've said that a couple times, but it is great to see so many people popping in, hanging out with us today as we do every day live at 1 p.m. for a couple hours, Monday to Friday, here on our YouTube channel. And, of course, you can check out the podcast wherever you get your favorite pods. Um, 
the price. I, I Before the Vancouver trade, I did not think. Like, I thought it was wishful thinking maybe that Montreal would be getting the first rounder. Um, the fact that they did, is it more to do with the scarcity of centers that could fill a role like this? Um, and how much does it have to do with the bar being set by Vancouver with the price that was paid for Elias Lindholm and what was left on the market? Well, I think that Vancouver's price does set like the the high bar for for prices. I think Lindholm is in a different class of player. Uh, so yes and no on that front. But for me, it's about scarcity. And, you know, Sean Monaghan, who I'll say lots of positive things about his, you know, his vision, his playmaking, his power play impact, his face-off impact, all that sort of stuff. But the idea that he is the go-to next up center on everybody's list does imply a relatively thin market at this position, I think. And so the idea that instead of just a few hours or a few minutes of like, let's say Lindholm's deal was done with half an hour to go until trade deadline on March the 8th. Well, I'm not sure how much of a bidding war there's time to get into in that, in that scenario. Maybe teams panic and I'm wrong to think this way. But what I think is that with over a month to go of Sean Monaghan's name as the top trade target, um, that price was going to go up. I think that teams were going to pivot to Monaghan I think there was going to be competition for his services and that the Jets paid a first round pick, which is no small price, to be clear. It's not. Um, I think it's a reflection of the market, of scarcity, and of the fact that if you were going to get the guy that you thought fit, um, you would have to pay up now to get in front of all of it. Yeah, well, best case scenario, it's the 32nd pick and they have to give a third rounder in 2027 because that's the conditions that if they win the cup, there's a third rounder and that would be a, that would be a pick the Jets would be more than happy to send over to uh, to the Montreal Canadiens.